Poetry is such a mystery. I, I, personally, I love to write haiku, but it's, it's such a mystery to me. And what we really need to do is like have brain scans of all those people to find out what's really going on inside their minds. So it's exciting. Tonight, um, we have some of the nation's best poets here tonight and tomorrow night, as you know. This is Marilyn Nelson and friends tonight. And one of her friends, and the reason that we have the class, is because of Bill Moore. He's coordinating this class. Let's hear it for Bill. And Bill is a poet and designer. He's been writing and publishing poems, prose, um, free prose, rhyme prose for over 40 years. So, from Cal State Long Beach, please welcome to the stage Professor Bill Moore. Some time ago, I heard the definition of a poet. A poet is a writer who doesn't write every day. We think about writing a lot, but we don't necessarily write every day. But not at Monterey Bay. The poets here have been writing furiously day after day. And they will be sharing the work that they've been they brought to the page, uh, put on the page, and they're going to bring it to the stage uh, this coming Friday at 3 o'clock. Um, so I hope you will join us all then. But I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you to Monterey, CSU Monterey Bay and CSU Summer of Arts for making this class possible. And I want to thank each of you for showing up tonight. This is actually a much larger crowd than many times poets get for a meeting. So it's really terrific to look out there and see all of you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to just warm up with a few short poems. One is for a Los Angeles poet that both Cecilia I uh, knew and admired, uh, the poet Bob Flanagan. And this is a poem called One Miracle. Stunned by tequila from the night before, I remember poking at embers as dawn puffed its mist into a clearing. Bob sang and coughed, sang and coughed. Even then, I wondered how much longer he had. Every time his body jerked, I winced. I loved his improvised, contaminated genius. Tonight, he's in the hospital again, alone. And this poem is like a waitress who deserves a big tip, half the bill, for telling me it's time to stop drinking coffee and drive over and rescue him, perform the one miracle I'm allowed to in this life. But I'm not, because he's not the one I'm supposed to say. Thank you. One of the poets that, that Cecilia and I uh, admire very much is Holly Prado, um, a, a poet who's been writing now for well over half a century. And one of the things we learned from her was to trust how dream material will want to enter a poem. So this next poem is best understood as a dream poem. And I dedicate it tonight to Holly Prado. It has the image of an ironing board that turns into a pier going out into the ocean to sort of follow the quick transition of the poem. In the ocean of nothingness, wading into clean, wrinkled laundry, my ironing boards appear with button-down barnacles. The water will be warmer tomorrow, it sloshes around my ankles as I walk between sticky pilings. Hip deep, I finish the sleeves of my third shirt, lean back and float on crescents, and float on crescents of disbelief until I sink. A little background noise, even in these depths, makes illusions more believable to anyone gazing down, I went for a long swim last night between 
two tiny continents, the entrails of a transparent fish swayed in mordant harmony. Near dawn, it spoke. I am this universe. Its gills rippled like buoyant silk. This next poem's a poem that celebrates marriage and a long life of my father and was written shortly after he died back in 1994. It's called Big Band, Slow Dance. Were you close, I'm asked, as if grief would sting less deeply? Were we friends as well as son and father? Further apart, two men could never meet, though blood bends through arteries, veins, and capillaries, summoned into presence by his pleasure. Oh, that I could have grown more slowly. Remember being small and cradled like treasure. Thank you. Give me two more poems. Um, one of them is about a very celebratory evening I spent with a friend of mine, Miles Frieden, uh, out of the bar in the San Gabriel Valley, from where some of our students hail, at Cal State University, San Bernardino. It's called Scorpio in the Summer. At a Pomona bar, the mirror on the wall reflects the dancers thrusting arms and legs. Miles and I flick between the men who haven't chosen their passengers, no different than dancing by myself, consecutive undulations, I leap and sweat, punches from my skin, I'm unrepeatable, incoherent pivots, slip backwards, sideways, bounce, jerk, spasm from elbow to ankle, clap and crouch, the fun of the body's anti-language, impossible to repeat an improvised acceleration, sway, flush on my face, I catch the music's flow of flesh, a blur, a song, receding into vortices of exhaustion. Lean against the wall. Where did you learn to dance like that? No one taught me. I'm simply desperate. <laughs> and my final poem is a, is a prose poem. And you'll note that this piece has um, really very, use, very little use of the first person pronoun in contrast to the earlier poems. It's a prose poem called Why the Heart Never Develops Cancer. One of the mysteries of the body is why the heart does not develop cancer. Every other organ in the body, stomach, skin, brain, lungs, liver, can develop cancer. But the heart squeezes itself again and again without the least trace of malignancy. It is as though the heart is a furnace, and anything cancerous which enters is immediately consumed by the heat of its pulse. On the other hand, the only pleasure the heart receives is imaginary. The skin, the stomach, the lungs, all these organs are capable of enjoying sensual life the warmth of the sun, a feast of vegetables and turkey, a good smoke, and therefore they are more vulnerable. The heart has only our blood to be its companion. Blood, like the heart, receives no direct pleasure, and it brings no relief to the heart, which denies that the body it inhabits means anything more than a warm place to work. <laughs> the heart like the life force itself, is absolutely impersonal. The heart does not care what happens to the body. It is there to work as hard as possible for as long as possible. And in return for the body's acceptance of its indifferent loyalty, it never betrays the body by consuming itself, cell by cell. And now the fun part begins, especially for me, because 
This is a real celebration of a project that began a year and a half ago when I first heard about summer arts. And it was a little bit like somebody learning about fantasy baseball. You know, you get to assume, you get to assemble your favorite poets. I said, really? And I have a budget? I, oh, this is amazing. So I immediately went to work thinking of all the wonderful poets that I wanted to bring into my program. And the very first one was Cecilia Wallach. Uh, who I've had the pleasure of knowing and working alongside with as a poet in Los Angeles for over 30 years. Um, she is um, not only a, an award-winning poet and the author of um, several important collections, in fact, six in all, including Earth, winner most recently of the two Sylvia's Prize, as well as the collections Carpathia and Sigan the Gypsy Poem, which has been translated into several languages and staged in several countries, but she's a force to be reckoned with as a poetry organizer. If this class is successful, it's because I'm simply copying the model that was put together by Cecilia at Idlewild Arts, where she assembled an extraordinary uh, poetry, annual poetry conference, and she brought to that festival such poets as Terence Hayes, Natasha Trethewey, Robert Wrigley, Galway Cannell, Richard Garcia, the list went on and on. We're talking Hall of Famers here. And of course, one of the big poets she brought was Marilyn Nelson. So the reason I want to say, the next thing I want to say is the most, in a way, the most important thing. The reason I asked Cecilia to be here for two weeks is that the, all those poets came to Idlewild because they knew she was their equal. And she absolutely is. Please join me in welcoming one of my favorite poets and someone who is indeed a prized treasure of American poetry, Cecilia Wallach. Anyway, we'll have some fun. Hi, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, I'm just going to read five poems because uh, I want to get to hear Marilyn. Um, and I thought I would start, I will begin with a confession. Even though confessional poetry isn't very fashionable anymore, um, you can see by my attire I'm not very fashionable. Um, so I'm going to start. It's a secondhand dress for my, my sister in Warsaw. I'll tell her you liked it. <laughs> so this is a poem, it's, it's, a, it's a catalog poem, it's a list poem, and I like to introduce it by saying it's a list of all my, my vices and my sins, and um, if it's not in this poem, I didn't do it. <laughs> Fireflies. And these are my vices. Impatience, bad temper, wine, the more than occasional cigarette. An almost unquenchable thirst to be kissed. A hunger that isn't hunger, but something like fear. A staunching of dread. And a taste for bitter gossip of those who've wronged me. For bitterness. And flirting with strangers and saying sweetheart to children whose names I don't even know. <laughs> and driving too fast and not being Buddhist enough to let insects live in my house. <laughs> or those cute little toy like mice whose soft gray bodies in sticky traps I carry lifeless out to the trash. And that I sometimes prefer the company of a book to a human being, and humming, and living inside my head, and how, as a girl, I trailed my slow-hipped aunt at twilight across the lawn and learned to catch fireflies in my hands, to smear their sticky, still pulsing flickering onto my fingers and earlobes like jewels. Aunt Barbara, she was the best. <laughs> this is an all-purpose love poem, which means it's for you. <laughs> for you, I'd stick the little pins of joy in all my arms, stitch my eyelids shut with stars, kiss the darkness from the dark. For you, I'd lean on wind and let hot sky lick up my dress. My thighs a cloud through which to plunge, 
my hands two prisons for your hands. For you, I pull the carnival of ribbons from my heart, commit the birdish sin of song, float down the river of your tongue. For you, I drown the wine with more wine, ruby up my hair, drag strings of fish along my waist, sigh like a heap of broken glass. For you, I keep each angel in its cage of light. For you. Wow. I, it's going a little faster than I thought it would. I mean, I'm going to read a poem from my father. Um, I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you this, but after, when my father was very ill for a very long time, and he was very diminished, and, um, you know, if you've been through something like that, it's hard to see someone you thought of as the center of the universe shrink. Um, but I had this wonderful dream in the midst of that terrible time. And in the dream, my father was um, shuffling down the hallway, much diminished, uh, white-haired, frail. And coming around from the kitchen was my father as he had been up until about, you know, 55 or 60, big-chested, broad-shouldered. Um, and my two fathers met at the corner, and they embraced one another. Ghost Sycamore. The winter, I knew you weren't coming back. I ran down the hill from the house, the path, through the woods turning red and gold with death. Dank leaves underfoot, branches twined overhead, and breathless stopped where the lake begins, having glimpsed through the tangled mist a glint of something glimmering, silvery, bright, I stepped from the shadows toward that shine, and suddenly there in the sky at my feet, on the lake's surface, shimmering, a tree, or the ghost of a white tree, lightning limbed, that seemed to have risen up from within the body of water, the body of sky, and again on the far shore, the other side, the same tree, Spectral, luminous, bowed as in grief at the water's edge, where it stood among the lush pines, bald white, stark, stripped of leaves, of rough outer bark. Old sycamore, old boundary marker, father, as I saw you in a dream once, self and other, self in this world and the next, as if a veil between them lifted, then everything went still. You don't have to clap for every poem. I'm gonna read two more poems. Um, I, was, I, I went to therapy once, actually more than once. <laughs> but once I asked my therapist, I said, um, her name was Carolyn, I said, Carolyn, does everyone think about death as much as I do? And she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> so, um, but you know, uh, I started to travel in, um, in Eastern Europe almost as soon as the Iron Curtain fell. I, I had a, a grand envie to go behind the Iron Curtain. And, um, and to search out the place that my family had come from, which meant I spent a lot of time uh, deep, deep in the Polish countryside, and I had to learn a lot of, to love a lot of things um, I didn't know I could love. And foremost now among the non-human things I love are meadows, afterlife. I want to be fierce and joyful and a meadow when I'm dead. Spindly flowers and waist-high grass and the shadows of clouds across that brightness shifting like so many ships in the sky. 
I want to be all in one place at last, but vast, a sea by the side of the road. I mean green, and I mean poppies and daisies, everything blooming at once. And I want to be again that girl who pushed into the wind, who stood up to the sun, big-mouthed and brave. I mean, if I'm going to die, let me live. Let me wade out into the darkest part of the night and name myself, wild-haired bitch of the mongrel stars, moon on her shoulders, dirt-rich, proud. If you're, if you're looking for an idea for a poem sometime, you could write about what you want to be when you die. I want to be a meadow. I'm, I'm cool with that. And, uh, and this last poem is the title poem from um, Carpathia. Carpathia is that one name for that region that's, it's a very, um, somebody wrote a book about the region called A Biography of No Place because it's kind of a place that's sort of mystical and doesn't really exist. But I've been there. It takes a long time to go there, but I've been there. Carpathia. Having rinsed off the soot and stink of the Polish train, having sung with the child, having eaten and laughed and wept, had my vodka with apple juice, my bread, Having walked through the fields at dusk and into the forest and back again, meadows of buttercups, thistles with bristling heads, the first blue cornflowers of June. Having opened my arms to the sky falling back on itself in my dizziness. Having taken the small purple berries that dropped from the wild bush into my palm, Siberian berries like tiny plums, put their sweet, bitter inkiness onto my tongue. Having failed and failed at love, having gone anyway, breath after breath, having trusted the world to be kind and stood in the doorway and listened for wolves and heard my own dead in the high grass whispering, beloved, 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 thank you. final reader for tonight, Marilyn Nelson, has published 24 books of poetry, including, yes, two dozen books of poetry and, and books for children, and including um, a really terrific collection of fast, called Faster Than Light, New and Selected Poems, 1996 to 2011. But as, since I'm a teacher, I'm somebody who would prefer to use this chance to introduce Marilyn Nelson to point out two things that might be of use to you young writers out there. The critic Walter Benjamin said, a writer who does not teach other writers teaches no one. In other words, a writer's job isn't just to find readers who are entertained by the writing, but ultimately your job is to teach the next generation of writers. And the only writer that matters is somebody that is good enough to become a master to the generations coming up. Marilyn Nelson is that kind of writer. But she wasn't always there. Once upon a time, she was sitting where you are. And if you think anyone was nudging her and going, oh, Marilyn, you're going to have two dozen books of poetry. You're going to win prizes. You're going to be famous. You're going to become one of the 10 best poets living in America, and I would put her very high in that top 10, okay? No one was saying that to her. Instead, she repeated the words of another writer to herself. I alone know what I am capable of. I alone know what I am capable of. Remember that when you leave this room, that Marilyn Nelson was a poet who looked up from the page 
and then looked back down and kept writing and writing. And here we are, how lucky we are tonight to hear somebody who is truly one of the masters of poetry, reading her poetry to us. Let us join together in welcoming someone who deserves, in my opinion, a standing ovation just for walking up to the podium. <laughs> but Marilyn Nelson. say that to you? She said, no. I opened my mouth and it just came out. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I told her then that I'm going to use that as my self-definition for the rest of my life. So uh, I, I am going to read some lyric histories this evening. And I, I, I'm going to, I don't know how many I can, I can fit in, um, but I have, well, I'll just read. The first I'll read is um, an 18th century story. These are all true stories. This is an 18th century story. It's a story of a man named Fortune who was enslaved in Waterbury, Connecticut in the 1720s, 1730 period. Um, he uh, was owned by a doctor whose name was Preserved Porter. And uh, Dr. Porter, uh, at this time there were no medical schools in, uh, in North America, and uh, doctors learned their trade from earlier doctors. Usually uh, these skills were passed on within the family. And um, uh, when Fortune died, uh, Dr. Porter took his body to a hill outside of Waterbury and uh, performed a dissection, which was illegal at this time, so it was a secret dissection. And then he um, stripped the flesh from Fortune's bones, drilled holes in the long bones, uh, boiled all of them to free them of all flesh and marrow, and then carefully numbered them and reassembled the skeleton and hung it in a room in his home to serve as a medical school. And meanwhile, Fortune's wife, Dinah, and their four children were still enslaved in the Porter household. And um, uh, the skeleton passed on through many generations and finally arrived in a local history museum in Waterbury. And it was the museum um, which hired um, forensic uh, scientists and historians to look into this skeleton. And um, this team discovered this story. And, um, the uh, director of the museum asked me if I would write uh, some poems to honor Fortune. So I'm going to read um, three poems from the book that came out of that. The book is called Fortune's Bones. And uh, this first one is the, in the voice of uh, Fortune's wife, Dinah. It's called Dinah's Lament. Miss Lydia doesn't clean the doctor room. She says she can't go in that room. She's scared. She make me take the dust rag and the broom and clean around my husband hanging there. 
since she's seen fortune head in that big pot. Miss Lydia say that room make her feel ill, sick with the thought of boiling human broth. I wonder how she think it make me feel. To dust the hands, what used to stroke my breast. To dust the arms, what hold me when I cried. To dust where his soft lips were, and his chest, what curved its warm against my back at night. Through every season, sun up to starlight, I heft scrub need one black woman alone except for my children. The world's so white, nobody know my pain but fortune bones. Thank you. This is the words of Dr. Porter. He performed this dissection on a hill called A Brigador Hill, and that's the title of the poem, On a Brigador Hill. For 50 years, my feeling hands have practiced the bone setter's healing touch, a gift inherited by porter men. I have manipulated joints, cracked necks, and set my neighbors back to work. I've bled and purged fever and flux, inoculated for smallpox, prescribed fresh air and laudanum, excuse me, prescribed fresh air and vegetables, cod liver oil and laudanum, and closed the lightless eyes of the new dead. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Herewith begins my dissection of the former body of my former slave, which served him who served me throughout his life and now serves the advance of science. Note well how death softens the human skin, making it almost transparent, so that under my reverend knife, the first cut takes my breath away. It feels like cutting the whole world. It falls open like bridal gossamer. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Standing on a new continent beyond the boundaries of nakedness, I am forever changed by what I see. The complex, delicate organs fitted perfectly in their shelter of bones, the striated and smooth muscles, the beautiful integuments, the genius strokes of thumb and knee. In profound and awful intimacy, I enter fortune, and he enters me. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Fortune's, Fortune's uh, song, it's called Not My Bones. I was not this body. I was not these bones. This skeleton was just my temporary home. Elementary molecules converged for a breath, then danced on beyond my individual death. And I am not my body. I am not my body. We are brief incarnations. We are clouds in clothes. We are water respirators. We are how Earth knows. I bore light passed on from an original flame. While it was in my hands, it was called by my name. But I am not my body. I am not my body. You can own a man's body but you can't own his mind. That's like making a bridle to ride on the wind. I will tell you one thing, and I'll tell you true. Life's the best thing that can happen to you, but you are not your body. You are not your body. You can own someone's body, but the soul runs free. It roams the night sky's mute geometry. You can murder hope, you can pound faith flat, but like weeds and wildflowers, they grow right back. For you are not your body, you are not 
your body. You are not your body, you are not your bones. What's essential about you is what can't be owned. What's essential in you is your longing to raise your itty bitty voice in the cosmic praise. For you are not your body. You are not your body. Well, I woke up this morning just so glad to be free, glad to be free, glad to be free. I woke up this morning in restful peace, for I am not my body, I am not my bones. I am not my body, glory, hallelujah. I am not my bones, I am not my bones. century. It's a book about a village that was settled in 1825 in um, what's at what's now Central Park West and something like 85th Street. Um, this, there was a white farmer who decided for some reason to sell his farm, divide his farm into lots and sell it to free African Americans in Manhattan. And um, they bought this land, um, uh, clear, cleared it, built homes, started businesses, built churches, uh, and the, uh, they were there until 18, from 1825 to 1857 when the city decided it needed a park and it used the law of eminent domain to force them to sell their property, and um, it's under Central Park now. So this is 19th century. The village is called Seneca Village. My book is called My Seneca Village, and I'm um, going to read three poems from this. This first one, um, these are, uh, uh, there are census records of the village, and I used um, names from the census records, um, and this is somebody who was a child in, 1826. His name was Frederick Riddles. Um, his, this poem is called Too, Too Light for Gravity. A blue knitted cap hides the cockles of his hair. A thick striped sweater hides him from ears to butt. His mittens match the cap. His uh, match his cap, clearly mother knit. Short pants, tall socks, a down-at-the-heels pair of ankle-high black boots. His lunch and slate are strapped together. Shooter and Aggies clink in his right front pocket. In his right rear pocket, a sling. In his cerebral cortex, a fireworks of thought. What's God, anyways? And how does God decide who's rich and who's a slave, who's white, who's black? Why don't other people think what I think? Do white people bleed a different color blood? Can something be too light for gravity? Since I was born free, do I own myself the same as mama and papa own themselves? If you don't own nothing, what's the point of being free? Why don't the stars fall down? Did Adam name the numbers? How far? <laughs> Frederick is late as usual. He slides into his seat, his gaze caught by the world in the window frame. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, years ago, from, uh, when I was uh, doing, uh, was a student doing workshops, um, I was in Minnesota, and Robert Bly used to come to our readings, and we always knew we had done well when Robert Bly, Bly grunted. <laughs> and I, I learned then that that's a perfectly adequate way of giving feedback to the poet. Just, mm. <laughs> Robert Bly grunt, thinking about it. This is a poem dated 1831. Uh, the speaker is Sarah Matilda White. I made her a hairdresser in this, in this village. 
the poem is called Skyland, and I'm assuming that news of Nat Turner's rebellion, which happened in 1831, finally arrived in Seneca Village, and that the person who did hair would know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this is called Skyland. Elizabeth, that bump looks good on you. Don't blush, honey. Love is a joy to share. Now, what are we doing today with that mop of hair? Sit on down. I'll fetch warm water and shampoo. This week, shag bark nut oil with peppermint. Mortar and pestle and I are on a quest to find which combinations work the best, kettle by kettle of tr crushed oil and scent. You heard about Jane Bolden? Such a shame. Lean back. But she was lustful to the end, acted like every man was her boyfriend. Sometimes I was tempted to call her out of her name. Pat dry while I heat the oil. You heard about that Nat Turner that led slaves to rebel? For two days, whites in Virginia lived in hell on earth like us, I hear. Yet mad, no doubt thinking justice means turning the tables around, showing the cruel no mercy. That makes sense by the natural logic of experience, but it ain't the teaching my mama passed down. All right, Elizabeth Cornrows again. You're a too tender-headed girl. Try not to flinch. Fifty-five they killed, for which hundreds were lynched. Yes, he was a hero, a man among men. He was hanged, flayed, and quartered. They cut off his head. Maybe God spoke. Maybe madness played a part. But I believe vengeance harms the avenging heart. Was he right or wrong? Ask the future. Ask the dead. All done. Tell Obadiah to watch his back. Thanks. Have a nice day. Yes, that's on my list of things to ask when I'm called to my rest in that sky land where everybody's black. Uh, this is uh, uh, a woman named Ma Nancy Morris who in the census records is identified only as a widow. This is 1838. Um, she's a conductor on the Underground Railroad in my, in my imagining her. This is called Conductor. When did my knees learn how to forecast rain <laughs> and my hairbrush start yielding silver curls? Of late, a short walk makes me short of breath and every day begins and ends with pain. Just yesterday I was raising my girls. Now I'm alone and making friends with death. So let the railroad stop at my back door for a hot meal. What do I have to lose? The Lord has counted the hairs on my head and made a little space under my floor. All I ask of life is to be of use. There'll be time to be careful when I'm dead. Birth is a one-way ticket to the grave. I've learned that much slowly over the years, watching my body age. Time is a thief, and what we give away is all we can save. So bring on the runaways. I know no fear. Let life have meaning if it must be brief. From, from this uh, from this project, this is I'm thinking African American village abolitionists probably spoke in the churches in this village, and um, this is a poem that's made up of um, snippets from uh, speeches delivered by Frederick Douglass. There are two voices in the in the poem. It's called Words and Whispers. The words are the words of Frederick Douglass. You'll identify the whispers. A battle won is easily described. 
The moral growth of a great nation requires description and reflection to be seen. Hey, that's mine. <laughs> a little learning is a dangerous thing. The want of learning a calamity. You better give it back. <laughs> the life of a nation can be secure only while it is virtuous and true. I mean it. <laughs> America has been false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future, too. Give it back. <laughs> no harvest without plowing up the ground, no rain without a rumble of dark clouds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is easier to build strong children than to piece back together broken men. He started it. For he who sows the wind reaps the whirlwind. Yes, I'm. <laughs> uh, another, another, um, another book, another project, um, another lyric history. This is the story of a young woman named Prudence Crandall, who in eighteen. She uh, was asked by the town fathers of Canterbury, Connecticut, to start a school for girls. She started a school, had about a dozen girls. Uh, it, it was a boarding school. The town fathers helped her buy the largest house in town. Uh, she had uh, started this boarding school, and about halfway through the first year, a couple of African American girls who were servants in homes in this village asked whether she would allow them to sit in on some of her lessons when they finished their work. She was a Quaker, a radical, red hair cut short, 1830s. Um, she said yes. And uh, when these um, black girls started coming to the school, um, the townspeople, first of all, the parents of the white girls took the girls out of the school, of course. Uh, and they tried to force Prudence Crandall to reject these black girls. And um, instead of rejecting them, she closed the school for a couple of weeks. And then she took out ads in the abolitionist <laughs> newspapers announcing that she was opening a boarding school for young ladies and little misses of color. <laughs> That made all hell break loose. <laughs> the well was poisoned. The village refused to sell them food. The girls were harassed. Uh, finally, when the building was set on fire, um, she closed the school and left. But for about a year, she had a boarding school, the first girl school for black girls in this country in Canterbury, Connecticut. And I'm running short of time, so I'm going to read this quickly. This first one, there, she was um, she was uh, arrested and put in jail for opening the school. This is the same time as the Amistad mutineers. A lot of the attorneys who worked with the Amistad uh, mutineers also worked with Prudence Crandall. So you can you can visualize. Uh, okay, she was put on trial, and uh, this is a poem based on the court records. Um, I call it the, the Tao of the Trial. Uh, and there's, uh, it's just a lawyer's voice, and then the voice of the Tao. Miss Crandall, you stand accused of knowingly teaching colored persons not residents of the state without prior consent. What is your plea? The teacher does not instruct. The teacher waits. Girl, has anyone been teaching anything to you and your friends? Who taught you how to plead the Fifth Amendment? 
Your honor, I submit as evidence of the alleged teaching of alleged students, this color girl here, who openly reads books and gazes skyward, who has been overheard conversing animatedly in polysyllabic words and referring offhandedly to the ancient Greeks. The teacher teaches without words and without action, simplicity, patience, and compassion. Canterbury by stagecoach uh, was named Anne Eliza Hammond. And when she arrived, this poem just describes what happened when she did, uh, when she arrived. I won't I won't give more of an introduction because it's actually all in the poem. This is called Miss Anne Eliza Hammond. And uh, this book is a collaboration uh, with Elizabeth Alexander. Each of us wrote half of the sonnets, it's a collection of sonnets. Uh, and we had a long talk about what could this girl have been like? She was about 14 years old. She came alone by stagecoach to this little village in Connecticut, and she stayed in spite of all this stuff that was going on. What was she like? So this is what we imagined she was like. I brought here in a bag between my breasts money from Mama's friend who had bought herself, then saved enough by working without rest to free four friends. This woman gave me her wealth of carefully folded dollars so I could take Miss Crandall's course of study. And within a week of my arrival, I was summoned to appear in court. The judge ruled I'd have to pay a fine, depart, or be whipped naked. <laughs> Honey, the first white fool who thinks he gonna whip me better think again. You touch me and you draw back a nub, white man. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't paying and I'm staying. People's dreams brought me to this school. I'm their future in a magic looking glass. That judge and the councilman can kiss my rusty black. <laughs> so we've been talking about sonnets, crowns of sonnets. I'm going to end with a with a crown of sonnets, um, which is. Uh, was written for, uh, it was written for a publisher who asked me to write a book about lynching for children. Yeah. I thought, huh. <laughs> okay, this is a heroic crown of sonnets. I've talked to the people in the poetry uh, class about this form. Uh, a, a, a heroic crown of sonnets is a sequence of 15 sonnets in which the last line of each one becomes the first line of the next one. The first line of the first sonnet becomes the last line of the last one. And the last sonnet is made up of the first lines of the first 14. So it's a very, very tight form. And in mine, the last sonnet is also an acrostic. Uh, I, I got carried away. I uh, the, the first letters of the of the last song that spell out R I P M -T L till. Uh, so I'm just going to read it. It takes about probably. Why does my clock keeps disappearing? Okay. I, I, I'm just going to read it. It's called A Wreath for, for Emmett Till. Uh, and I think I'll just read it without reading the section number or something. I'm just going to read it through. Rosemary for Remembrance, Shakespeare wrote. A speech for poor Ophelia who went mad when her love killed her father. Flowers had a language then. 
rose petals in a note said, I love you. A sheaf of bearded oak said, your music enchants me. Golden rod, be careful. Weeping willow twigs, I'm sad. What should my wreath for Emmett Till denote? First, heliotrope for justice shall be done. Daisies and white lilacs for innocence. Then mandrake, horror, wearing a white hood or barefaced, laughing. For grief, more than one, for one is not enough. Rue, you, cypress, forget-me-nots, though if I could, I would. Forget him not, though if I could, I would forget much of that racial memory. No, I remember like a haunted tree set off from other trees in the wild wood by one bare bough. If trees could speak, it could describe in words beyond words, make us see the strange fruit that still ghosts its reverie, misty companion of its solitude. Dendrochronology could give its age in centuries by counting annual rings, seasons of drought and rain. But one night, blood spilled at its roots, blighted its foliage. Pith outward, it has been slowly dying, pierced by the screams of a shortened childhood. Pierced by the screams of a shortened childhood, my heartwood has been scarred for 50 years by what I heard with hundreds of green ears, that jackal laughter. 200 years I stood listening to small struggles to find food, to the songs of creature life which disappears and comes again, to the music of the spheres. 200 years of deaths I understood. Then slaughter axed one quiet summer night, shivering the deep silence of the stars. A running boy, five men in close pursuit, one dark, five pale faces in the moonlight. Noise, silence, back slaps. One match, five cigars. And that Till's name still catches in the throat. And that Till's name still catches in my throat, like syllables waylaid in a stutterer's mouth. A 14 year old stutterer in the South to visit relatives and to be taught the family's ways. His mother had finally bought that white socks cap. She made him swear an oath to be careful around white folks. She told him the truth of many a Mississippi anecdotes. Some white folks have blind souls. In his suitcase, she packed dungarees, t-shirts, underwear, and comic books. She'd given him a note for the conductor, waved to his chubby face, wondered if he'd remember to brush his hair. Her only child, a body left to bloat. Your only child, a body thrown to bloat, mother of sorrows, of justice denied. Surely you must have thought of suicide, seeing his gray flesh chains around his throat. Surely you didn't know you would devote the rest of your changed life to dignified public remembrance of how Emmett died, innocence slaughtered by the hands of hate. If sudden loving light proclaimed you blessed, would you bow your head in humility, your healed heart overflow with gratitude? Would you say yes 
like the mother of Christ? Or would you say no to your destiny, mother of a boy martyr, if you could? Mutilated boy martyr, if I could, I'd put you in a parallel universe, give you a better fate. There is none worse. I'd let you live through a happy boyhood, let your gifts bloom into a livelihood on a planet that didn't bear Cain's curse. I'd put you in a nice, safe universe, not like this one. A universe where you'd surpass your mother's dreams. But parallel realities may have terrorists too. Evil multiplies to infinitude like mirrors facing each other in hell. You were a wormhole history passed through, transformed by the memory of your victimhood. Erase the memory of Emmett's victimhood. Let's write the obituary of a life lived well and wisely, mourned by a loving wife or partner, friends, and a vast multitude. Remember the high purpose he pursued. Remember how he earned a nation's grief. Remember accomplishments beyond belief, honors enough to make us ooh slack joy as if we looked up at a meteor shower or were children watching a fireworks display. Let America remember what he taught, or at least let him die in a world trade tower, rescuing others that unforgettable day, that memory of monsters, that bleak thought. The memory of monsters, that bleak thought, should be confined to a horror movie world, a horror classic in which a blind girl hears one by one the windows broken out and acts at the front door. In the onslaught of terror, as a hate-filled body hurls itself against her door, her senses swirl around one prayer, please God, forget me not. The body snatchers jiggle the doorknob. Werewolves and vampires slobber after blood. The circus of nightmares is here. She screams, he screams. Neighbors with names he knows. A mob heartless and heedless, answering to no god, tears through the patchwork drapery of our dreams. Tears through the patchwork drapery of dream, for the hanging bodies, the men on flaming pyres, the crowds standing around like devil choirs, the children's eyes lit by the fire's gleams, filled with the delight of licking ice cream, men who hear hog screams as a man expires, watch fob good luck charms, teeth pulled out with pliers. Sinners, I can't believe Christ's death redeems. Your ash hair, Shulamith. Emmet, your eye. Machetes, piles of shoes, bulldozed mass graves, the broken towers, the air filled with last breaths, the blasphemies pronounced to justify the profane, obscene theft of human lives. Let me gather spring flowers for a wreath. Let me gather spring flowers for a wreath. Not lilacs from the dooryard, but wildflowers I'd search for in the greening woods for hours of solitude, meditating on death. Let me wander through pathless woods beneath the choirs of small birds trumpeting their powers at the intruder trampling through their bowers, disturbing their peace. I cling to the faith that innocence lives on, that a blind soul can see again, that miracles do exist. 
in my house there is still something called grace, which melts ice shards of hate and makes hearts whole. I bear armloads of flowers home to twist into a circle, trillium, Queen Anne's lace. Trillium, apple blossoms, Queen Anne's lace, woven with oak twigs for sincerity. Thousands of oak trees around this country groaned with the weight of men slain for their race, their murderers acquitted in almost every case. One night, five black men died on the same tree with toeless feet in this land of the free. This country we love has a Janus face. One mouth speaks with forked tongue, the other reads the Constitution. <laughs> My country, tis of both thy nightmare history and thy grand dream, thy centuries of good and evil deeds I sing, thy fruited plain, thy undergrowth of mandrake, which flowers white as moonbeams. Indian pipe bloodroot, white as moonbeams, their flowers, picked one blackens and one bleeds a thick red sap. Indian pipe, a weed which thrives on rot, is held in disesteem, though it does have its use in nature's scheme, unlike the rose. The blood root poppy needs no explanation here. Its red sap pleads the case for its inclusion in the theme of a wreath for the memory of Emmett Till. Though the white poppy means forgetfulness, who could forget when red sap on a wreath recalls the brown boy five white monsters killed? Forgetting would call for consciencelessness, like the full moon which smiled calmly on his death. Like the full moon which smiled calmly on his death, like the stars which fluttered their quicksilver wings, like the unbroken song creation sings while humankind tramples the grapes of wrath, like wildflowers growing beside the path a boy was dragged along, blood spattering their white petals as he, abandoning all hope, gasped his agonizing last breath. Like a nation sending its children off to fight our faceless enemy, immortal fear, the most feared enemy of the human race. Like a plague of not knowing wrong from right like the consciencelessness of the atmosphere, like a gouged eye watching boots kick a face. Like his gouged eye which watched boots kick his face, we must bear witness to atrocity. But we are whole, we can speak what we see, People may disappear leaving no trace unless we stand before the populace, orators denouncing the slavery to fear. For the lynchers feared the lynchee, what he might do, being of another race, a great unknown. They feared because they saw their own inner shadows, their vicious dreams the farthest horizons of their own thought, their jungles immune to the rule of law. We can speak now or bear unforgettable shame. Rosemary for remembrance 
Shakespeare wrote. Rosemary for remembrance, Shakespeare wrote. If I could forget, believe me, I would. Pierced by the screams of a shortened childhood, Emmett Till's name still catches in my throat. Mamie's one child, a body thrown to bloat, mutilated boy martyr. If I could erase the memory of Emmett's victimhood, the memory of monsters, that bleak thought tears through the patchwork drapery of dreams. Let me gather spring flowers for a wreath, trillium, apple blossoms, Queen Anne's lace, Indian pipe, blood root, white as moonbeams, like the full moon which smiled calmly on his death, like his gouged eye which watched boots kick his face. Thanks again for coming out. It's very, very